Well, hello, friends, and welcome to another update on Iceland. Today is Wednesday, August 6. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. And it's been a little while since we've done an update on the volcanic situation in Iceland. I was gone on a Grand Canyon River trip last week, but I'm back now. Well, the big news here is the eruption is officially over as of yesterday, August 5th. So that means this eruption began July 16th, concluded on August 5th. That's about 20 days or so. This was the third longest eruption of the Sunukur series, these set of eruptions that began in December of 2023. This was the ninth eruption in that series. And you can see there on that live webcam view just what's left of that last vent that's now just degassing and cooling. You can see a few patches of sulfur on some of the lava surfaces there. And that's what we have so far. So the last few days, this last vent uh, exhibited somewhat cyclical uh, periodic bursts of lava, low level effusion rates for the most part, um, and then some quiet periods in between. Uh, the total volume of eruption from this this, this specific eruption, the total volume of material erupted was around 30 to 35 million cubic meters. And that lava pad or that flow field covers an area of about three and a half uh, square kilometers. Let's go ahead and look at sort of the last gasps of this eruption. Um, credit this YouTube page here. So you can see this was on Monday. You can see these uh, images of this the lava just erupting in the crater, mostly confined to the crater, so it's not leaving the crater. So this was sort of the last gasp of this volcano's uh, behavior. We'll just kind of skip around a little bit here. But over the course of those 20 days or so, it did build uh, an impressive cone. I don't know what the estimates are in the height, but it's definitely taller than the last drone flight we did with Johan and Nature Eye. It's probably approaching 45, 50 meters or so, I would guess, just looking at it imagery here um, so you can see just some views there of the last stages of the eruption of the cone looking along the trend of the whole fissure there and then just to give us a little bit of perspective since we did some of those drone flights uh, you can see here that kapuka that was surrounded early on in the stages there, kind of looking back towards the the south southwest so that's what we have for the volcano um, Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the last Met Office update, which came out yesterday. The big takeaway here is the eruption is over. So the Met Office put an official nail in the coffin on this phase of eruptive activity. Um, we've got uplift that has resumed. So that's a big, uh, big thing moving forward. Uplift has resumed, according to all the measurements, about two to three centimeters. So far, I'll show you some of the data for that here. In a bit, this confirms magma is still accumulating beneath Svartsengi, and if uplift continues, it could lead to new magma intrusions and future eruptions. Uh, we'll also look at some uh, interesting work that our good friend and viewer Bruce Garner has done here at the end of the update. He's got some uh, just forecasts and rough predictions based on what we've seen in the past that might give us some in, uh, insights into what exactly might occur moving forward. Uh, and then the last thing I think in part of the Met Office update is just reiterating the danger level of walking around on that lava field, even though the, there's no more lava at the surface per se, there's still lava just below the surface. It's quite hazardous. And so we can't uh, reiterate enough for folks to stay off of that lava as it cools and solidifies, which many times can take years, sometimes even decades. Uh, earthquake activity. Um, nothing of note near the eruption site and Gurindavik. We've got a little cluster of quakes over in the Krishuvik system near Lake Krevavatn, kind of typical of what we've seen in the past. A little swarm in the last 24 hours here offshore along that ridge before it comes in and connects with the peninsula. So there's our look at earthquakes over the past uh, week or so, or excuse me, past day or so, looking at the past week. Again, pretty low level rate, similar pattern, not much happening around the eruption site. Um, just a few over here near Krishuvik, and then that cluster offshore. Um, and then we do have the, the ongoing uh, seismic activity uh, to the north here at the east end of the Sneifelsnes Peninsula. And there's so, some interesting discussion going on there. I'll probably leave that for another update, maybe as we go into this quiet period 
at uh, the Sunukur area north of Grindavik, we can focus on some other areas of Iceland. GPS data shows, uh, we'll, we'll start with the Svartsengi, but I will note here the scale. So notice this is an incredibly uh, large value here, 200 millimeters, 20 centimeters. So these lines don't really show much uplift, but nonetheless, you can see the trend here since that July 16th eruption began. You can see there's a slight uptick here. I think the data shows up a little bit better on some of the other stations where it's scaled a little bit differently. So if you go over here to the Elvarp, uh GPS station, you can see the uplift that was going on leading up to the, to the July 16th eruption, then the deflation once that lava started erupting. Uh, but you can see since then it's, it's resumed some, some of that elevation that it lost after the eruption. Some of that's been recovered. So we're here at about, I guess, what, 40 millimeters on the plot. It looked like it got to about 160 millimeters, at least at this station, and that was enough to trigger the eruption. So we need to recover, at least at this station, a good um, 120 millimeters or so of uplift before we can even, most likely anyway, before we can expect another intrusion or eruption. So the GPS data is looking quite a bit similar. Uh, you can see the uplift on many of the other plots and it curving upwards as you look at any any one of these here. Uh, we can also see the uplift going on with the INSAR data, the interferograms. And so here's one from July 19th. So satellite passed over on July 19th. That was just a couple days after the eruption. Another pass on August 3rd, and it's measuring the elevation difference. And it shows that in bands of color. So you can see here, we've got purple, back to purple, and then into green, but not quite a second band of purple. Each band of color, this is the Cosmos Sky Med. So that's a good uh, centimeter and a half of elevation change from one band to another. So probably looking at about two or so centimeters of uplift. Again, it's all, it's all centered on that magma storage zone which sits underneath the Blue Lagoon and the power plant area. You can see some of the distortion of the colors here because that's where the active lava was actually uh, erupting. And so it was dis distorting and changing the land as it was actually building up the land in that location. Um, so those are our interferograms. That's what we have so far. And then what I'd like to do is share with you some of uh, our good friend Bruce Garner's data. So he has sent me an email and has some fun data that we can I can share with you here. And this is, uh, he's got several of these on his uh, YouTube channel. So I'll make sure there's a link to that under the video description if you wanna check these out again on Euro. So what he has here is a time-lapse showing us the earthquakes, uh, the arrival of the earthquakes and their magnitudes from April 1st to April 4th. Now this was the prior eruption that was on April 1st. This was really more of an intrusion event and an extrusion, but what, what this will allow us to do is we'll look at this one and then look at the most recent eruption and see two very different patterns of earthquake behavior. Remember, this was mainly an intrusion, so that magma had to move into new places, fracture and generate earthquake activity uh, to make space for the magma. So we're gonna see a little bit more pronounced earthquake response here to this event. So we'll go ahead and let that play. This one's about a minute long. So you can see the date up here at the top right corner. So here we are on April 1st, there's the intrusion. And then you can see it taking off. Let me run that back a little bit. You can see after the initial pulse of activity, it takes off to the northeast and the southwest, but then it really keeps going and tracking to the northeast primarily. Uh, and that's where we saw a lot of that activity going on on April 1st. Eventually it did dribble out a little bit of lava that lasted for a few hours near Grindavik. Um, but most of the activity and most of the lengthening of the dike and that magma storage area was off to the northeast here. And so that was our look at the April event, uh, April 1st. And that's pretty much it for that one. Let's go to the next one here. So this one is uh, July 16th to the 17th. So just a day or so's worth of data. And this is the big event, the most recent eruption that we had here. But what we'll see is we'll see most likely um, not as much lengthening of the earthquakes in terms of their overall uh, distribution along the dike. So this was more of just an eruption as opposed to an intrusion. So everything right around that area, a little bit of propagation there, 
uh, but then it dies off quickly, right? Just within a few hours of the event. Remember the last video clip, we saw three days worth of data. On this one, we're, we're seeing about 24 hours or so. So notice again how quickly those earthquakes uh, arrive, right? When this whole thing begins just after midnight, uh, the earthquakes do take off to the northeast a little bit, but then they die down with just within a few hours. So an interesting contrast in behaviors there between those two eruptions. And then the final time lapse he has here, and this one's a, a much longer clip. We might skip around on this one, but it is fun to watch the whole thing. This goes back to the very beginning. So this is early 2023, all the way up into July 21st of this year. So what you can see is we're here in January of 2023. There's just really nothing going on north of Grindavik. Very few earthquakes, a few over here at Fagradalsfjot. Here we are in February. Uh, I might jump forward just a little bit here. March, April, or again, 2023, May. Just really just low levels of earthquakes happening during this time. Uh, as we get here, there's a little burst there. So Ju June, a little burst over here on the Krishivik system, it looks like here in July. And, but that's not related to the actual intrusion. And then as we roll into the fall of 2023, once we get closer to October, we'll see the big uh, earthquakes start to pop up. We'll see bigger circles, larger magnitudes, and greater frequency. So keep an eye on that top right corner for, probably make this bigger. There you go. So here we are in, in uh, September. Here we go into October, or almost into October here. Quake's picking up a little bit. But as we get into October, and then late October, November is when this thing is really going to take off. So here we are, late October, boom, there's the intrusion, a magma still accumulating. Here comes a massive quake. So when the dike forms right there on July, or excuse me, on November 10th, uh, and then those die down a little bit, tiny little dots would be small magnitude quakes. I wonder if I can go back and almost pause it on that. Big burst there. Right about there, yeah, right there. There's all, you can see all, all these larger circles, big magnitude quakes. Um, and then as we roll into the rest of November and ultimately in December, uh, the system is just continuing to pressurize. It's made space for itself. And then this will culminate on December 18th right here with our first eruption. So that was kind of a quick one there. Here we are rolling into January. Here's a quick blip on January 14th. Boom, right there. That was our second eruption. Now we're rolling into February, and the next one we'll see is February 8th, right there. It was another small eruption that lasted a day or two. Uh, things got quiet. So you can see that, you know, the, earth, the events, there's the March 2nd intrusion. Hard for me to talk and keep up with this. March 16th, right there, another small one. But you can see that the earthquakes largely uh, track with those eruptive events. Really slow period here. This was while we were having an eruption, but it, uh, it lasted a month and a half or so, but low levels of earthquake activity. Going into May, we built up for the end of May, I think it was May 29th. So here it comes right there, boom. That was the May 29th eruption of last year. And then during the summer of last year, it was pretty quiet. Um, that May eruption lasted for a few weeks, if I remember right. But then the system was recharging, repressurizing, low level of earthquake rates. It started to ramp up. And then the next one we get here will be August 22nd. So here that one comes right there. Boom, that was further north. You could see that northeast uh, section of the dike increased in terms of length, more eruptive activity there. Now here we are in the fall of last year, and our next event will be on November 20th. You can see again, low levels of earthquake activity, October. And as we roll into November, those pick up a little bit, start seeing a little bit more. We should see most of that activity up here again. There you go, there's the November 20th event. Not a lot of earthquakes. This was the one that I think was, uh, remember right, this one was uh, preceded by low levels of uh, earthquakes, not a, not as many as we'd seen with some of the other eruptive events. Now we're into 2025, January. So this is all going to start building towards that April 1st event. And we should see it again, kind of build right there in the middle and then lengthen to the southwest and to the northeast as we get closer to that. So some bigger earthquakes here, but mainly around the that, that primary eruption site. 
We're in March now. Earthquake's picking up. And here we go for, boom, April 1st. Just wow. Just like that new intrusion, a little bit of an eruption down here at the end. Um, and then the whole thing just kind of reverberating for that period of time. Going into May of this year, things quiet down a little bit. And then we start build. Now we're in June, just isolated quakes here and there. It's still producing seismic activity, but not like those eruptive events. And then we get to the July 16th event right there. And then it quiets back down quite a bit. So um, fun to watch that. That was uh, pretty neat to see the whole series kind of going there. And then to wrap up this update, just some fun graphs that our good friend Bruce Garner has put together. So this is for the Svart Sengi station. This goes all the way back to 2023 and the fall. And you can see the uplift data. So we're just looking at the up-down movement of this station. Uh, so here is our November 10th intrusion that starts the whole thing off with all the earthquakes and such. Building back up for the uh, December 18th eruption. So the pink lines vertically are eruptions. And he's got these labeled as episodes. E1 for eruption 1. I1 for intrusion 1. Um, and so you can see that some of these that are longer lasted more time, like this one here in March. So there's uh, the second intrusion, March. But the idea here is this sawtooth pattern shows the inflation-deflation signal. And with each event, for the most part, we've it been able to increase the height of the station. Presumably, as the crust becomes hotter and more elastic, it's able to become a little bit more pliable and, and rise higher, like a balloon, if you will. We can get more air into the balloon because it's a little bit uh, more pliable. And so the idea here is he's you know, using some analysis to make some just very crude but, but helpful uh, forecasts as to what we might see moving forward. Here's that April 1st event, which was both an eruption and an intrusion. And then our July 16th event here, um, which see how high the GPS station rose at that point. And what he's using here is just sort of extrapolating this line out. So we're not sure exactly how the uplift is going to go. Is it going to be linear? Is it going to be more exponential curve? But just crudely, um, he's got a possible window of another eruption or another intrusion. Looks like it's mid-November or so. So just based on, again, this somewhat uh, just simple analysis, um, I'm sure he wouldn't, you know, it's not a prediction. It's more of like a forecast, and it just gives us some idea of how it might behave moving forward. Uh, so we have that one. Uh, this is now he's just using different GPS stations. So using a different GPS station for this station, we get a forecast window of about um, early December, so late November, early December. Uh, then looking at yet another one there, this one pushes it more like into mid-December. So sort of that late November to mid-December time frame seems to be uh, what maybe we might see just based on this analysis here. Um, so uh, let's see, what else do I have for you? Um, yeah, I think that was it from Bruce, but appreciate his work on that. Always helpful. And I'll make sure I put links to that under the description. So moving forward, we're kind of back to this, you know, period between eruptive phases. So we're going to go back to tracking the data, tracking the ground deformation with the GPS and the INSAR, maybe looking at the earthquakes a little bit and just seeing how this plays out, um, seeing what happens, how much time it's going to take before we get to this next event. But we do have magma still uh, rising and filling the shallow subsurface chamber uh, or shallow subsurface storage zone. And so we'll have to see moving forward just exactly that, how, how that plays out. But probably looking at several months of you know continued magma accumulation in that zone before we get to the next big event in this series. So thanks for joining me. I'll keep you posted on other events. Uh, thanks for liking the channel, subscribing. Uh, if you want to donate to the cause, there's links under the video description. And we'll see you next time. Take care.